Lumos. I solemnly swear that I'm up to no good. One million eighty four thousand one hundred and seventy words. Forty one hundred pages. One hundred ninety eight chapters and one universal story, encapsulated within seven novels that sparked a global phenomenon. It's the story of the boy who lived, and it will transcend generations so long as people continue to believe in magic, that a power bigger than themselves exists. Only the Bible and Chairman Mao's Little Red Book have sold more copies. Over the years, they've garnered dozens of awards, and together, the film versions have raked in nearly eight billion dollars worldwide. But like the close-minded Dursleys, not everyone is a fan of Harry. It was in New England in the 17th century when a book was first banned. And ever since, America has kept up this inglorious tradition. It's not to say that the arguments justifying the banning of Harry Potter were unfounded. The Christian community had their reasons. In the 2011 article, Religion and Harry Potter, two arguments are offered. One is that the positive messages are packaged in a medium, witchcraft, that is directly denounced in scripture, and that Rowling's heroes typically do not sacrificially turn the other cheek, as Jesus advises. But saying that Harry Potter teaches kids witchcraft is like saying Grey's Anatomy teaches you how to be a heart surgeon or law and order teaches you how to be a lawyer. That notion, in the words of J.K. Rowling, is pure lunacy. Um, one of my favorite moments, right, in a bizarre way, <laughs> because you know how when you sort of uh, offend some people, you know you must be doing something right. <laughs> well, there was my favorite, one of my favorite photos from Potter was, um, I think, I think it made the cover of like the Times or some, you know, prop, big proper newspaper. And it was a, a huge bonfire oh, in God, some yes. state in America, I think. And it was somebody had, throw, was th had thrown a calendar and through the air, smiling, was Rupert Grint's face being tossed into the flames. And it was one of the, and it was, and it was one of the abiding images that I've always remembered. It's that much funnier that it was Rupert. Yeah, <laughs> isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, just so that it was just... quite serene kind of going into the fire. And it, and it, and it was lovely. But um, does that bother you or no. do you think no, what, that's does actually it, does a good sign? No, it does it bother me? No, it uh, never bothered me because um, I felt that the, the, those particular criticisms yeah. were utterly misguided. Yeah. I have no track at all with those, those kind of views, so if they want to burn my books, feel free. Yeah. Quite contrarily, the book's biblical underpinnings, both the subtle and the not-so-subtle, prove the opposite. Harry's story reflects that which has been hailed as the greatest in human history, the story of Jesus of Nazareth. Funnily enough, Jesus Christ was actually a potter in his own right, a potter of men. You, Lord, are our Father, we are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Isaiah 64, 8. Whether Miss Rowling meant this to be a tongue-in-cheek comparison, or whether it's mere coincidence remains to be seen, but the simple fact that theme parks have been built so that readers can live out their bookish fantasies, and college courses have been created where the seven novels are the textbooks, are each a reminder that an entire generation of children, now grown into adulthood, will score higher on questions about Harry's life than they will on St. Matthew's biography of Jesus Christ. Upon closer inspection, Harry Potter critics may find that the two stories aren't as different as they seem. Both narratives tell the timeless tale of the triumph of good over evil and are quintessentially analogous. In fact, death is arguably the most prominent theme in all seven books, more specifically fear versus acceptance as Harry faces it countless times. Miss Rowling has stated that Harry was the prism through which she viewed death, having just started writing not long before her mother passed away. But the odd thing is, I mean, this is life, isn't it? The books wouldn't be what they are if she hadn't died. I mean, her death is on virtually every other page of the Harry Potter books, you know. The, 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 at least half of Harry's journey is, is a journey to um, deal with death, 
in its many forms, what it does to the living, what it means to die, um, what what survives death. It's, it's there in every single What the love of your books. parents, the Absolutely. love of your parents, how that abides what, with yeah, you still. Exactly, yes. exactly, exactly. So if she hadn't died, I, I, I don't think it's too strong to say there wouldn't be Harry Potter. There wouldn't, you know, the books are what they are because she died, because I loved her and she died. That's why they are what they are. Joanne Rowling, the first person on earth to become a billionaire by writing books then lose her billionaire status for donating too much of her money to charity, grew up attending the Church of England, which may explain the religious illusions found within her stories. These references, at least for her, were always apparent. Could then Patronuses be angels, pure spirits almost saintly in their task of protecting the conjurer? After all, in Latin, patron means protector or advocate, hence the term patron saint. For Harry and his father James, their quote-unquote spirit animal, is a stag, a natural enemy of the snake, and a common depiction of Christ in early Christian art. Similarly, Dumbledore's phoenix is also a symbol of being born again. The otter, Hermione Granger's, is the only foe of the basilisk, and the doe, that of both Lily Potter and Severus Snape, has long been a symbol of maternal love. In this way, Rowling has ensured her message of love is represented by a physical, invincible force, which protects anyone who takes the time to properly develop it. In the same vein, could some of the central role model figures, such as Albus Dumbledore, be archetypes of patron saints? In the context of how I was writing about him, in other words, he's giving... Oh, clearly, he, he is, he's John the Baptist to Harry's Christ, isn't he? He's the, nice. he's the nearly ran man, the man who yeah. nearly could have had the yeah. hallows, but he was too power hungry. That was yes. what was interesting to me about Dumbledore. So he's used in the book, clearly, he's, he's, he's a, the fount of all worldly wisdom, and he teaches Harry what he needs to teach Harry because he recognises that Harry is going to be, he is going to be the one. John the Baptist, who's honoured as a saint in most Christian traditions, was followed by Jesus. The account of John's death in the Gospels is, like Dumbledore's, a tragic case of a person just following orders. The young woman who requested John be beheaded did so reluctantly, going along with the wicked wishes of her mother. Just as Severus Snape was reluctant when he performed the killing curse, having been under the unbreakable vow, a spell that forced his hand. The author of the 2013 article, Harry Potter and the Legends of Saints, points out that in Deathly Hallows, Neville Longbottom is similarly depicted as saintly. Neville's torture, augured by the notorious torture of his parents by Lord Voldemort years before, echoes that of Saint Margaret the Virgin. When Neville is asked to join Voldemort's side, he vehemently refuses, as any steadfast saint would. When Voldemort attempts to set him on fire, Neville walks out of the flames unscathed, just like St. Margaret, who, after refusing to denounce her Christian faith, was first set on fire, then thrown into boiling water, but emerged from both incidents completely unharmed. Another example of eerie similarity might be in the resemblance between the Deathly Hallow symbol and that of the Holy Trinity. With the former, each part of the emblem represents three legendary objects that, if united, would make a person the master of death. The three objects include the Elder Wand, the Resurrection Stone, the Cloak of Invisibility. While each point of the latter signifies the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both signs exemplify a means to achieve immortal life. In the sixth book, we're told that repentance can restore the wholeness of the soul, quite literally in Voldemort's case. Rowling has, in the image of his damaged soul, provided an example of the idea that one damages one's soul by sinning. Perhaps then, Horcruxes are the opposite of pure Patronus spirits, the dark version of magical protection. Literarily, these objects provide an illustration of the belief that earthly achievements can obtain a person immortality. In Hebrew, one definition of the phrase to be evil translates as to be broken into pieces, and that's precisely what Voldemort has done, broken his soul into pieces by way of murder and ruined what was once good just as Christians believe sin tarnishes the goodness of the human soul. Initially, there are seven horcruxes, but seven is considered a holy number in the Bible, 
one that represents completion. Then the reader finds out that Harry is the eighth Horcrux. In numerology, the number eight often means self-destruction. Direct references to biblical scripture can be found in the books as well, etched on the tombs of the dead. The headstones of Dumbledore's sister and mother have an inscription taken from chapter 6 of the Gospel of Matthew. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Rowling uses this quote as a means to express that Dumbledore's heart lies with his family. Taken in the context of Voldemort, however, we see that the same scripture becomes perverted. He chooses to store what he considers to be valuable, his own soul, in earthly possessions, the Horcruxes. And etched on the gravestone of Harry's parents is 1 Corinthians 15.26, which reads, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. What Rowling doesn't say in the books is that this verse is from the passage in the Bible where the Apostle Paul discusses the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the article, Life and Death in Harry Potter, the author compares the doubts and trepidation that Harry feels after realizing he's a Horcrux to the same fear that Christ felt in the Garden of Gethsemane. This garden in Jerusalem is where Jesus prayed and his disciples slept the night before his crucifixion. Likewise, this is when Harry experiences a similar internal battle about what's to come in the days ahead. And as to his fate, Rowling leaves us a clue in the very name that every witch and wizard fears to speak. The name Voldemort has French roots, translated as will to death or one who flees death. This knowledge offers the reader insight into the Dark Lord's true nature and ultimate aim. That in fearing his own mortality, Voldemort will be the wizard defeated, and Harry, accepting his death as a necessary sacrifice for the greater good, will be the one to survive, hearkening back to the title of the first chapter of the first book, in which Harry is once again the boy who lived. Other instances of foreshadowing occur every time Harry escapes death, and there are plenty of times. Each incident happens in the presence of a symbol of Christ, the phoenix for rebirth, the philosopher's stone for eternal life, the stag patronus for Jesus himself, and the list goes on. In the 2007 article, Christ-like, the author makes the connection between chapter 35 in the Deathly Hallows titled King's Cross and the obvious Christian meaning behind it. In this chapter, Harry looks up to see a great domed glass roof that glittered high above him in the sunlight, where he talks to a father figure with long silver hair and a beard whose supernatural powers are accompanied by a profound message of love. To Christians, this should sound familiar. But ultimately, it's the novel's non-religious themes that drive the story forward, showing great heroes fighting for what they believe in, struggling against bigotry and oppression. It's Rowling's talent at weaving these universal themes into a vivid coming-of-age tale filled with wonder and mystery and adventure that makes the books what they are. Regardless of readers' cultural and religious upbringings, the theme that is constant, that permeates every continent, every country, every creed, and every culture, is love. There's a verse in the Bible, one of the most famous of all, that reads, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And with love, all is well. <laughs>